Yes, well, it's worth talking about cannabis. Uh, I certainly, I don't think I would be who I am if it weren't for cannabis. And it, it hasn't particularly affected my memory. I'm actually the most devote, on a lifetime scale, the person most devoted to cannabis that I've ever known is myself. I mean, when I lived in Asia, I used to set my alarm for 2 a.m. to smoke because I couldn't go from midnight to 5. And, uh, you know, pe people thought I was bananas. Uh, in terms of its deleterious effect, I mean, it, as I, I think it's pretty on a scale of the other major drugs of commerce, which would be alcohol, tobacco, and white sugar, I think it comes off as in the best position. Um, I sort of think of it as, uh, you know, going back to this partnership model about mushrooms in Africa, that when that all dried up and those people were moved into the Middle East and there had been previous waves of migration out of Africa that had established populations in Central Asia. This is why you have like Peking man and Java man. Those are, those are earlier uh, remnants of earlier migrations. Cannabis uh, uh, botanically originated north of the Himalayas on the plains of Central Asia. And I think it probably uh, is the best substitute for mushrooms on the cultural level. Uh, it's, it's interesting. See, it was early on. It's one of the oldest domesticated plants. It was early on associated with cordage and fiber. And it's strange that all the words that associate to narrative are also words about weaving. I mean, you weave a story, you unravel a yarn, you, uh, th you know, thread, unthread a situation, you untangle a situation. It's the parallelism is very old in all European languages, this association uh, between narrative and fiber, which means hemp. So I, I sort of see it as um, the pilot light of Gaian consciousness that was kept going. Now, what people always say to shoot this down is they say, well, but Islam tolerates cannabis and Islam is hardly the pilot light of Gaian consciousness. Mm, yeah, I mean, it, the, it isn't actually that Islam tolerates cannabis, it's that the Quran expressly forbids alcohol. And then that leaves you to sort it out from there. Uh, I certainly think cannabis should be legalized and that if every serious alcoholic were encouraged to be a pothead uh, and to other drug abusers encouraged toward pot, the problem with pot from a societal point of view is that it, it, it is psychedelic enough that like all psychedelics, it erodes loyalty to cultural values meaning this is the bullshit effect, you know, you just, people say, you know, why don't you get a job? Bullshit, why should I? <laughs> uh, I don't see it implicated in violence. I mean, I think if anything, probably cannabis in, in ghettos is holding down violence as a drug, but probably promoting violence as an item of commerce, and that is because of chuckle-headed laws. I mean, I'm absolutely convinced that the way to solve the drug problem is to remove the profit motive. That's so obvious that I just, it's baffling to me. And society is so schizophrenic on this topic. I mean, the most dangerous drugs are alcohol and tobacco, both fully established in the uh, engines of commerce. Um, it's a bizarre situation and, you know, largely driven by the agenda of Christian fundamentalism in collusion with criminal syndicalists who see this as an opportunity for enormous profit and, uh, you know, cynicism all the way along. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I do find that, um, I mean, I can't smoke a lot of pot because it just... Uh, 
unfortunately, I can never become addicted to any drug as much as I try. My body just doesn't tolerate it, but and I've tried them all more than once. But um, but I do find with pot, I mean, I've had friends who became podcasts who, it wasn't that they betrayed commerce, they lost their ambition. And, you know, and I, I mean, you're very intelligent, and you, you know, you've got a vision, and you're, you know, you're dedicated to your vision, you can pursue it. But, you know, you're a little bit above most average people, but, or different than most average people. Manic is what you're trying to say. Yes, I understand. But, I, mean, I would say, you know, really got lost because of their addiction to talk. And well, so I think that there's more an issue around, it's not about drugs as much as it's about addiction and the issue of addiction. That's right. And how addiction is, you know, individuals become addicted because they're avoiding certain psychological issues that they're, you know, struggling with that, uh, you know, rather than dealing with the issues, they, you know, turn on the TV. Well, this relates to this larger model we talked about of time, of the war between habit and novelty. The thing that offends people about drugs, and if it doesn't offend you, there's, I think, something wrong with your value system, is to observe unconscious, repetitious, self-destructive behavior. I mean, if that means betting on the ponies, or chasing hookers, or shooting junk, or making bad investments, or always blowing your stack with your friends, whatever it is, repetitious self-destructive behavior triggers disgust in the, in the rest of the gang. And uh, drugs, you know, for instance, heroin and tobacco are interesting examples because both they are probably tied for their addictive ability and yet you know to shoot heroin I mean people just turn away aghast it's like you're the lowest of the low cigarette smoking until very recently was tolerated everywhere now what is the difference here the person smoking the cigarette we know that tobacco is tremendously destructive uh, that's beyond argument uh, heroin, on the other hand, if you shoot with clean needles and have a steady supply, in other words, if you're not putting in social factors, my God, these junkies live forever. You know, they just pickle themselves and live forever. <laughs> and they don't get sick. So, so, then, but, so then why is it that society is so abhorrent of heroin addiction and so accepting of tobacco addiction? The answer is the presentation of the intoxication. When you shoot heroin, first of all, you become very agitated and follow people around raving at them. And then you, if you're an addict, and then, if, and then you nod. And so you drool and your face falls in your plate and your friends have to put you to bed. Uh, tobacco, on the other hand, you know, you can maintain. There is no dramatic uh, sequela of symptoms to betray that, you know, you're completely jacked up and twisted <laughs> around and self-poisoned with this, but there you are at your desk working efficiently, making phone calls, making money, keeping it all together. So uh, it's the presentation. Then the other thing to say about drugs is that like everything else about us, but even more so, drugs are subject to the genetic her your genetic heritage of drug receptors. And so uh, it's not the same for everybody or even close to the same. I mean, uh, the range of response to drugs can be over several orders of magnitude and can vary throughout your life. So, you know, the fact that I can smoke endless amounts of cannabis and still produce and function it just means that I can. I see people, you know, alcoholics who drink. I mean, if I have more than a drink and a half, I have headaches and I pay my dues. And, you know, to watch somebody go down on a fifth of Stolichnaya, you just realize, you know, this person is a Martian, metabolically <laughs> speaking. I mean, it would just kill me to do that. So uh, this has to do with tolerances and the way the organism can accommodate itself to toxins. But then below that, at bedrock, it actually has to do with genetic uh, 
uh, proclivities, yeah. Um, with regard to back to cannabis as a hallucinogen, um, is there a difference in your experience in, in smoking versus ingesting it, uh, eating? Uh, well, that, yeah, that's a good point. See, ha, uh, hashish, or the way cannabis entered the West was as hashish, which was eaten in the 19th century. And if you read the accounts by 19th century savants who, who ate large amounts of hashish, uh, it will convince you, you know, that it was the LSD of the 1870s. I mean, these are mad intoxications that they are describing. It's not sitting around, you know, seeing the wallpaper move. And, uh, uh, well, they were eating it. Why did cookies and brownies, LSD topless brownies, why did, why did that lose fashion? Is there a danger in it? No, I think when pot went from $15 a lid to 475 people stopped cooking with it. Uh, but le let, me, let me say this about, uh, about eating hashish. If you're going to do this, I recommend that you eat a, red, a Lebanese hash if you can, because you see Lebanese hash is made in a way that people don't really touch it in the same way that charas is made in, in India by people whose uh, hands may not be so clean and you know you're going to take a hit essentially of the uh, ambient bacterial population of the village of Hamarubitsar <laughs> and you know your guts will go completely berserk this is one argument for baking it in a cookie is to get the pathogens at least smacked down a bit but if, you, if you've never read Fitzhugh Ludlow's book, The Hashish Eater, Confessions of a Hashish Eater, it's hilarious. I mean, here it is. It's 1852, and he's at Union College in Riverdale, New York. He's been invited to the dean's tea, and, uh, and, and he's just taken this massive hit of cannabis jelly before arriving at the tea. And he says something like, uh, uh, when the umbrellas protruding from the oriental umbrella stand turned into gargoyles, I knew that I must excuse myself, lest I run the risk of betraying my condition. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, I'm too loaded, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> Lou, um, let me say one more thing about this. There's a wonderful book called Shaman Woman Mainline Lady that is writings by women about drugs. And uh, if you want to read something that just will make you roll on the floor with laughter, it's Louisa May Alcott's account of a picnic she and her friends went on with a doctor, somebody or other. And it's just the most insane thing. I mean, it's these incredibly pretentious Victorian femmes uh, with this doctor by this river in the English countryside. And, and uh, it's Lil and Nell and Dolly. And Dolly says, Oh, doctor, we're, we're so exhausted with canasta. Surely you have some new little divertissement that you can share with us. And he says, well, Dolly, uh, I do have uh, this, uh, this uh, little case of uh, the best Moroccan hashish bonbons from Paris. And they say, oh, and then it, and it's, it's madness. I mean, uh, it, it's just the most extraordinary thing. Um, yes. Does cannabis, cannabis work on the brain or chemically? Does it stop? Or? It's not very well understood. Uh, there is a receptor, uh, but cannabis is not an alkaloid. Cannabis is technically a polyhydric alcohol. Uh, which makes it a chemically unique type. It's also bot botanically unique. Cannabis, it's what's called a monotypic genus. In other words, uh, these three species 
ruderalis sativa and indica, which are all obviously speciated within historical time and can, by chromosomal studies, be shown to be all derivatives of Rusula, the Central Asian wild type, uh, it has no near relatives. Uh, and so it's, it's unique and it's not well understood. As far as somebody asked about using it psychedelically, I think that the real, and I can't say I do this because I need it for other reasons, but in terms of the pure psychedelic issue, the way to do cannabis is once a week in silent darkness, alone, with the best stuff you can get, and then just, you know, do as much of it as you can possibly do in as short a time and sit with it you will every single time be absolutely torn to pieces by it, you know. I mean, it is just astonishing. The problem is that people get into it, myself included, for other reasons than that hallucinogenic uh, uh, flash. But that would really be the ideal way. And also it would prove you were a person of great rectitude and self-control <laughs> if you could do that. Yeah.